is to see my students doing what God called them to do. I, I pray for my students every Monday. I call their names before God and ask him to let them never forget the reason why they are in ministry. So um, even though you don't hear from me, don't think I have forgotten. Mm. Every Monday, every Monday, I call your name before God and ask him to continue to use you and to bless you and to allow you to fulfill the call he has placed on your life and to do exploits for him. Amen? Amen. But I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about um, why we're here tonight. Amen. So we're here tonight because I want to share with you about leadership. Mm. But before I get into teaching about leadership, I want to share with you what God is looking for in a leader. Mm. And I am going to share with you three things and then I, uh, that God is looking for, and then I'm going to get into what are the qualities the character and the responsibility of the leader. So let me let me start by saying this. God is looking for a man or a woman who who is willing to die to self. Why? Because if God can't change you, he can't use you. That's the first statement I want to make and I want you to understand. God is looking for a man or a woman who is willing to die to self. Because if God cannot change you, he cannot use you. The day you stop obeying God, and the day you stop changing as God calls upon you to change is the day God will stop using you. Now, let me give you an example. You remember King Saul? God chose him. He was Israel's first king. But the day that Saul decided to disobey God's command and do what he felt like doing and what the people wanted to do, God replaced him. I'm sure you remember Moses. There has not been a leader like Moses. Never before or after such a great leader. A man who spoke with God face to face. A man who God said was the meekest man. And yet... When Moses disobeyed God, he did not follow God's instruction. God set him aside and said, you will not lead the people into the promised land. He chose Joshua. I'm trying to get you to understand the thing God is looking for more than anything else. He is looking for obedience. And if you are not willing to obey, or you're not willing to change, and you're not willing to die to self, God can't use you. I don't care what qualities you have, what education you have, what abilities you have, all the giftings you have. God's number one thing he's looking for in any leader is the willingness to change, to die to self. The day you stop obeying is the day God will stop using you. Now, let me share with you the three other things I want you to understand. 
in God's preparation process in your life for ministry. Number one, God will develop you for the ministry he has for you, not the ministry you want. He will develop you for the ministry he has for you. He knows what he wants you to be. He knows the plans he has for you. And so he will develop you for the ministry he has for you. That's number one. Number two, God will defend you as you fulfill your ministry and your call. Not everybody is going to believe in you. Not everybody is going to support you. You can be doing all that God has asked you to do and you're going to face opposition. But if you allow yourself to be caught up with fighting your own battles and trying to prove that you are the person for the job and that you, you are who God has called, that's not your problem. Your problem is follow God, die to self, obey God, and he will defend you. Remember what I said, he will develop you. Second, he will defend you and fulfill your call. The third thing I want you to understand is God destined your destination. God destined your destination. Where you go, what you become, the work he does in you and through you, it's not about you. You don't have to ensure I'm going to make sure I get this. I'm going to make sure I become this. No, God destined your destination. And he works in you and through you to ensure that you become all that he plans for you. You don't have to fight. You don't have to prove God will do it. Amen? So I want you to understand He's going to change you. And if he can't change you, then he can use you. He put Saul aside. He stopped Moses and put Joshua to lead the people. Because the day they stop obeying is the day God stops working. And that's the same for you. There's no man or woman that's so big that God cannot find a replacement. Amen? Now, that's, that's my opening statement. I want you to remember that and walk with that and never forget that. Now, let's talk about leadership. The leader in any position, whether it's in, 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 in the church or in teaching, wherever you are as a leader, you are a bridge. The leader, he or she helps people to move from where they are to where they need to be. That's your position as a leader. You become the bridge to help people to move from where they are to where they need to be. What I'm saying is the leader connects our past with our present and our future. That's the work of the leader. If you're going to be a good leader, you're going to become a bridge and you're going to help people. Now, the leader doesn't physically move people, but you inspire them to move. You motivate them. You, you, you bring the resources so that they are able to move from where they are to where they need to be to become the person God planned for them to be. So as a leader, you are a bridge between where they are, where they need to go, what they need to become. Now, John Quincy Adams 
says this about leadership. He says the leader or, or leadership is the ability to show others what is possible. If you're a leader, you develop the ability to show others what is possible. And you have that power to influence them to fulfill that dream. You show them what is possible and you encourage them and influence them to fulfill that dream. You make them see, oh, I can do this. This is possible. Yes, I could achieve this. I could accomplish this. If, if you can, through your actions, inspire others to dream big, to dream more than they've ever dreamed or to, to learn more, to do more, to become more than you are a leader. That's the job of the leader. You, you cause people to be inspired. Oh, I can do that. I can become that. I can learn that. I can do that. That's the job of the leader, to inspire people to become more than they even dream they could become. Now, what are the marks of a great leader? The first thing I want to emphasize about the marks of a great leader is character. Character is important. People become great because they have great character traits. You must first learn. This is the first character trait I want you to understand. You must first learn how to serve before you can effectively teach others how to serve. You must become a servant yourself. Learn how to serve. Learn how to follow orders. Then you are qualified to give orders and to lead others. If you don't learn how to follow, then you can't learn how to lead. The second thing in leadership is your performance. Leadership is not how well you can talk, what you can say, how you can impress people. No, leadership is your performance. Good leaders perform excellent. They follow through. They do what they say they are going to do. They, they accomplish what they say they are going to accomplish. And third, leadership, as I said at the beginning, descends from character. What am I talking about when I speak about character? In Luke 16, verse 12, Jesus says, if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? What Jesus is saying, if you're not faithful in fulfilling a responsibility that was given you, even though it may not have been something for yourself, but it was something you were doing for someone else, and Jesus said, if you're not faithful in doing what concerns another, who will give you, who will, will charge you with responsibility? Who, who will give you responsibility for something that is even more important? So leadership descends from people who have strong character and people who are leaders by example. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Now, one of the chief character traits of a great leader is spending time with God, making your time with God a priority. Why? Because it develops integrity. Making time 
to go deeper with God must be your daily priority. Apart from everything else, your spiritual life must be that every day you seek God, you go deeper with God, you hunger after God, you get to know God more. Because the more you have of God, the more you will have to give. Without that inner connection with God, your leadership is going to be lacking. It's going to be inferior. So spending time with God must be a priority in your life as a leader. Without that inner connection, you can't lead anyone anywhere because you don't even have a good foundation. Making time to go deeper with God, again, priority number one. Now, without that inner connection, your leadership is going to be shallow. It's not going to be effective. Now, if, if you go to Exodus 33, you're going to find that Moses dedicated a place that he called the tent of meeting. And that was where he met with God. Moses didn't leave meeting to God with God to chance. Well, if I have the chance, if I have the opportunity, if I'm not too busy, no. Moses erected a tent. He called it the tent of meeting. And every day Moses made time to spend with God. Moses was so effective in that, that his dedication affected the life of others. In verse 10 of chapter 33, you will read that Moses' dedication affected others. It affected Joshua to the point that Joshua didn't want to leave the tent of meeting. So, Moses spoke with God face to face on Mount Sinai, but Moses didn't come down from Mount Sinai and said, oh, I spent 80 days in the presence of God. You could ask me anything. I know God. I spoke to God face to face. I came down. My face was shining. Oh, I had a good, no, no, no. Moses had eight days in Mount Sinai with God. And when Moses came down, he erected a tent so that every day he can go in there and have communication with God. And even after all of that, you know what Moses said? Lord, show me your glory. I mean... Some people today would be writing books about, oh, when I was up in the mountain with God and God spoke to me. Moses is not looking to talk about the past. Moses is looking for a present, active, personal, daily connection with God. If you're going to be a leader that's going to accomplish anything great for God, you have to have that same hunger for God. Yesterday's connection is not good enough for today or tomorrow. So leadership descends from character and character is formed in the presence of God where he can share himself with us. Service to God must come before service to man. If you want to be a leader and you want to serve others and you want to lead others, you have to spend time in the presence of God. To be effective in God's service, you must put God's first. More of God or let me say this way, the more of God you have is the more you have to share. 
the less of God that you have is the less you have to share. You can't take people where you have not been yourself. You can't take anyone closer to God when you have not been close to God. What you receive in your closet is what you'll be able to share in your leadership. When you first put service to God in the right place, service to man will be effective and efficient and glorious. Note, leadership is more than just fulfilling a responsibility. Re leadership is about affecting lives for eternity, changing lives, bringing people into their divine destiny, their divine calling. Your private walk with God and your public leadership must go hand in hand. You cannot lead people where you have not been. You cannot teach them what you have not learned. And there are some things you can't learn from a book. You learn in the presence of God. So that is where your character is built. And that's where your leadership skills are sharpened in your private spiritual walk. Your public leadership must go hand in hand and you will be a success. Okay, honor God in private and he will honor you in public. You must go deeper before you can go wider. Let me use this illustration. Have you ever seen a storm blow through a neighborhood, a community, an area, and it's after the storm, you have palm trees lying along the road no the storm comes the palm tree bend and it comes right back up you know why as tall as the palm tree goes upward the root goes deep so palm trees don't fall over trees with big wide branches big expansion of branches fall over, snap like twigs. But the palm tree, it bows to the wind and it comes back up. You know, the reason for that, the root is deep. What is my point? The deeper you go in your relationship with God, the stronger your leadership will be. You cannot stand at all if you haven't gone deep with God, you have to go deeper. Let me put it another way. You can't take others where you have not gone yourself. You can teach them things about God that you have not personally experienced or learned. So you take people where you have gone. When you focus on a deeper life, you will become more influential because people will see in your life the fruit of your relationship with God and they will know you're speaking not from reading a book but from communion and experience with God. So intimacy with, with God must be first. Let me share with you how Christ exemplify this intimacy with God. Before Christ started his three and a half year ministry, he spent 40 days in fasting and prayer. Before Christ chose his disciples, he spent all night in prayer before he chose the 12. Now, let me ask you this. Before Jesus chose his disciples, before he started his ministry, 
before Jesus meet the crowds, he spent time in prayer. Over and over we would see Jesus withdrew himself to pray. If Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, would make intimacy and time with God a priority, and he was the greatest leader ever lived, how can we do anything less and hope to be successful? For effective leadership, I hope I make the point, you have to have intimacy with God. Now, for seasoned leadership, you must have intimacy with God, but you must also be faithful. Faithfulness must be the cornerstone of your life and your leadership. You're pointing others in a direction that you want them to go. You're becoming the bridge that takes them from point A to point B and to point C. Then you must be a person who is faithful. You must not say one thing and do something else. Your word must be your bond. In your service to God, it's not about names. We live in a day when everybody is a prophet or an apostle or some other name. It's not about the name. The name don't define your leadership. It's about your faithfulness. Are you dependable? Can you be counted on? Do you show up when you're supposed to show up? Do you do what you're asked to do? Are you faithful? Are you dependable? Is your word your bond? Do you enjoy helping others to succeed? Do you work to bring the best out of people? Can you be trusted? Are you consistent? Do you follow through when you give your word? If you say you're going to be there, are you there? If you say you're going to do something, do you do it? Or if someone has to chase after you to remind you. No, leadership is about character. Leadership, it's about integrity in your walk with God. Leadership is about influence, but leadership is also about faithfulness. If you are not faithful, you cannot be a successful leader. You will undermine your leadership. Listen, don't worry about names and titles and accolades. Focus on becoming the best you can be for God. Spend time with God. Develop that strong character that says you are a serious man or woman of God. Remember what I said, if God can change you, he can use you. Finally, be faithful. If you promise to do, do it. If you have a responsibility, it doesn't matter if everybody else fail or they don't show up, you show up. Be faithful, be dependable, make sure your relationship with God is first, number one. 
And I promise you, God will make you a mighty, powerful leader. My time is up. Mm. Oh. Mm. <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. Boo, did you love this? Yes, absolutely. Oh, well, sister, do you have time now for us to dig deep into this? Yes, yes. Question. Okay. I know today you are not the young one you used to be. You are the aged among us, the wise. Tell me <laughs> about the little girl from Guyana that got saved, who went to the streets to preach and then began to pastor. Tell us, how did you learn these nuggets from such an early age? Can you give us a little bit of that testimony? Oh, to God, that we would have the same one. Okay. I got saved at 11. And immediately I started working with some of the older um, adults and teenagers in doing street evangelism. Wow. I, when I got, I don't, I don't, I can't talk about anybody else's experience. For me, that night, I just felt like God poured uh, buckets of love in my heart. Mm -hmm. I was so excited about God. I, I went, my mother sent me to a Catholic school and, and Catholic schools in Guyana were very strict. So most parents wanted their children in the Catholic school. They were good in education, but they were very strict. And so I was sent to a Catholic school. I got saved the Sunday night and the Monday when I went to school, I tell every nun, every teacher, every child about, I got saved, Jesus is in my heart and you need to be saved. Wow. And they start like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> You should be a Catholic. You turn to something soft. I said, no, I found Jesus. He's the best thing that ever happened. Oh. So that's how I started. And, and to me, my salvation experience was so great. I don't know why anybody else wouldn't want that. Mm. Because I was full of love and joy and happiness. And it was great. And then at the age of 13, in a, in, in, a, in a missions convention, the church had a missions convention, and we had an evangelist from America. I don't remember what part of America he was from, but he preached, and then he said, there are people that God is calling to ministry. No, I am 13. So I wasn't wow. expecting that I yeah. would be called to ministry. Yeah. But God starts speaking to me and I'm like, I'm just a child. I'm not getting up. They're going to laugh at me. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna say, listen, this is not for children. Sit down. So I wouldn't get up. And the evangelist would not stop. He said, there's someone that God is calling that person did not stand up and I can't close the service till you stand up. I felt like all kind of needles and stuff going through my body. I am miserable. I am crying. <laughs> I don't want to stand up. I don't want to. I don't want to be a missionary. I don't want wow. And he wouldn't stop. And when I decided, okay, I'm going to stand up because this service is not going to end. I stood up. The evangelist said, amen, I can pray now. The person stood up. I'm like, oh he can't see me. I'm a little <laughs> girl and all these big people standing up around me. He got all the adults around and he's going to say he could pray. <laughs> so I left the service. I went home. I got in my bed and I said, you know what, God, I don't care what the evangelist said. 
It's me and you. You're going to have to tell me you're calling me to be a missionary because that was what the call was. God is calling you to be a missionary. I said, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't care what he said. You have to tell me. So I took my Bible and I used to like to have markers in my Bible. I take out all the markers out of my Bible. And then I spin the Bible around, turn <laughs> it upside down, and I spin it. And I said, God, I am doing this the wrong way. You do the right thing. If I put my finger on a verse and it does not say God is calling you, then I don't care what a man pray over me tonight. I'm not wow. going to be no missionary. So... <laughs> Remember, I took out everything in my Bible that could mark a spot. I turn it upside down. I spin it around several times, flip it open with my eyes closed and put my finger. I said, where my finger leave? It must say God is calling you. And when I open my eyes, my finger is at Jeremiah chapter one, verse three. <laughs> say not I am a child. For oh I have goodness. called you. <laughs> There's a verse like this in the Bible. Oh Say no time a child I have called you. I sat down and I read Jeremiah and I cried. And I said, God, if you wow. calling me, I'm going to do what you say. I was wow. 13. Wow. And then I said to God, God, you know that they don't have women in ministry. It's only men go out and be missionaries. So wow. if you want me in ministry, you have to tell my pastor that you call me. Wow. And so I will start preparing to be a missionary. Wow. So I go to church Sunday. And my pastor walked right up to me and said, Joan, I know God has called you. You will start teaching Sunday school next week, Sunday. I said, I am 13. I just came out of junior girls class. You will teach Sunday school. He gave me a Sunday school quarterly. And I started teaching at 13 years. Wow. And the rest is history. I have not stopped. Oh, my gosh. What year but, was that? Oh my God. If I was 13, it was 1950 something. Wow. Wow. And then and eventually I, you go to Bible college and you become a female pastor, a lead pastor, right? Yep. Yep. Wow. Yep. Amazing. I yep. am just in awe I of became, your testimony. I became a pastor. I start preaching on the radio. I did that for five years. On the radio. Then, yes. And then I took over the Assemblies of God Bible School in Guyana and led that for 10 years. Wow. And when I was doing that, the Lord said, your time is up. You're going to America. And I said, I don't want to go to America. Everybody is going to America. It's the land of opportunity. I just want to stay here. The Lord said, you're going to America. Come on. I went. We needed you. <laughs> a white boy like me from the suburbs needed that Afro-Latino <laughs> sister all the way from Guyana. I needed you. The Lord was saying, go be a missionary and reach those knucklehead little suburban kids that think there's something. Come on. <laughs> So that's how I came to America. God, as a God. missionary as for a us. Missionary. Yep. 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 Wow. And I know that you couldn't come the uh the month that we had first invited you because you were a part of the revival services. Now, do you hold the title of missionary at the church you're attending or prophetess? Or how do they uh, seat you and honor yeah. you? Joe, Joe, <laughs> I don't like names and titles. <laughs> <laughs> they call uh -huh. you mother. Mother no, Miller? No, no, no. I'm John Miller. I'm John Miller. That's all I am. Listen to me. Not around here. People Not put so here. people put so much emphasis on a name. I know. I, I prefer know. 
I prefer to put the emphasis on what I do. That's right. That's right. I don't care about the name. You don't have to call me anything. People say, oh, come on. Uh, evangelist, prophet. I'm not all of that. I'm Joan Miller, a Amen. servant of God. That's all Amen. I am. Oh, I love it. That's Amen. Well, let me get some of these grandbabies to snuggle up with you, sit on your lap, and get some uh, knowledge from you from Grandma uh, Miller here in the spirit. Rudy, what are you getting here from the woman of God of faith and power? I'm going to start with you, man of God. I just feel like it's such a blessing to hear it. I was like, I was just tuned in the whole time. First of all, it's it's such a blessing to hear from you, uh, Miss Miller. It's it's like, I don't know. It was like a, a breath of fresh air. It was like a sunshine on a valley. I mean, it was just beautiful to hear. <laughs> the the I mean, yeah, I'm just thinking about it, man. And, and, I, and because on, it just man. feels like. Ah, it was just everything was just so powerful, and just to hear your story, to hear these these great things of wisdom. For I know I speak for a lot, a lot of us when I say these are so essential to all of us. Um, uh, all the great things you pointed out and that you've given us today to ponder on to really like we can take this for the remainder of our lives here on earth and in ministry. All these great things, yeah. and and um, you know I see a lot of. Um, how Joe is and his his wisdom stuff coming from you too. I mean, literally, like even the way <laughs> Joe teaches, even the way Joe yeah. teaches, like yeah. people could be zoned in on him for like 30 minutes. Yeah. And the same was here. Like I was just focused yeah. in because you have that gift of teaching and leading. Yeah. And uh, it was a yeah. blessing to be able to hear it, you know? So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great. Well, I am, I am glad. I am glad that the, you know, what I said about the leadership was a blessing because I really believe what I said to you tonight, Amen. that if God cannot change you, he cannot use you, yeah. you know? And I think if more people will realize that obedience is the key, that's, That's right. what God is looking for. That's Obedience right. and intimacy. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've, I've never stopped thinking about the fact mm. that as great a prophet as Moses was, one disobedience and God says, you're not going in the land. Mm. Come on. You're not going in the land. It just mm. shows us how much. And just recently, the Lord's been just showing me that from creation, he's been saying the same thing. Yeah. Adam and Eve lost it because of disobedience. That's right. Mm -hmm. The obedience is the key. You cannot be a leader and not yeah. obey. Yeah. 